Do you think now that Bitcoin is adopted by these institutions, they also manipulate the price movement in a certain way? Or like, what's your view on that? People have these kind of questions because of the history of Bitcoin. I mean, really recent history too. When you look at FTX went bankrupt in 22 and they had a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And then lo and behold, they went bankrupt and they didn't own any Bitcoin. The people that had accounts at FTX were essentially they were being screwed and they were holding paper promises for nothing. But I do not think that these ETFs operate this way. I mean, there's just a world of difference between auditing, the professional, the quality of the individuals, the quality of the institutions involved. And you're talking about BlackRock and Fidelity versus, you know, we're talking about a, a startup in the Bahamas like FTX was. All right, Thomas Ferrer, welcome back to Bitcoin for Millennials. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Awesome to have you on again. For the people listening, uh, you can check out episode 15, where Thomas and I already chatted. That was about eight months ago. And now I think you are also very much focusing on how the ETFs are going with like daily updates and stuff. So I would also recommend uh, for people to follow you to learn more about that. And I think, yeah, that's also a great place to start. I, I wanted to ask you, like since the launch of the Bitcoin ETFs, you know, BlackRock has not had a single day of outflows compared to all the others did, did have that, right? What is your general view on the Bitcoin ETFs up until now and the impact that they're having? Yeah, well, I mean, well, actually, so BlackRock had, had an outflow last week, actually. Oh, really? With, yeah, so they, they've had, I think they've had two days of outflow, but I mean, basically, basically none, which has been kind of crazy to witness. And it's like, it's it's kind of really become like a really fun thing. Like everybody's sort of watching it daily, kind of in disbelief when you see basically, well, lately every other... Uh, ETF is is selling off and BlackRock just re seem, seemingly refuses to have an outflow. Even when they have had outflows, they've had tiny outflows. But yeah, I mean, it's it's been really interesting to watch like this year kind of, you know, it's a big development for Bitcoin sort of embedding itself into the traditional financial system. Uh, it kind of creates also just like this new interesting lens, new new way of looking at the Bitcoin market. I mean, you do get kind of, I guess, fresh ways of seeing what's happening. Like not just, obviously we've always had, you know, the price goes up and down and that's signal. But now there's another lens you can apply to it. Um, I, I think about, for example, kind of a time recently, which is really interesting when you had Germany was selling like, you know, pretty famously selling like 50,000 Bitcoin. I think that was in what, July or the months mm -hmm. at all kind of blend into one, but so I think that was July. And then at the same time, you're watching this like wall of buying coming from the ETFs and you could, you could see like, okay, the price is kind of going down here, but look at these inflows into the ETFs. And you actually, we literally got to watch these, these Bitcoin move, you know, essentially from Germany to the U S during that period of time. So it's, it creates a really interesting way to kind of look at the market. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ETFs launched in, in January this year, and it's been also kind of crazy because it was just such a hot start, right? Like, you know, we're talking like 10 plus billion in the first two months alone. It's kind of cooled off, you know, you'd, you'd have to say, a apart from like this sputtering surges that have come in different times throughout the year, like in July, you know, there was, a, there was a sort of a surge again of flows, but it's kind of like come and gone. But we saw these the big jump early in the year. And we we're all sort of kind of sitting around wondering, like, when is that, that second wave? When is the next wave of flows coming in, which we're kind of watching? But yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been really interesting. So you said these, these, this 10 billion in the first few months, I think the most bullish outlook from professional watchers was like 20 billion in, in a year, which I don't know. I'm not sure if we passed. I don't know if you know the, the, the number currently. Yeah. It's about, it's about 20 billion. Yeah. R roughly, roughly 20 billion so far. And yeah, you're right that most people, like most people thought that was even like, more than you would get in a full year. 20 billion was was overshooting it. There were some kind of, you know, some people had a more bullish outlook. Standard Chartered, you know, their analysts, they kind of thought we'd be looking at like 25 to 50 billion. And well, we, we, we might still get, I mean, kind of, if, if, if Bitcoin has this kind of like a big, big Q4, 
we might actually end up getting getting pretty yeah. close to that mark, but maybe not. I mean, but it's but yeah, it's sitting at about twenty billion so far. Yeah, and we had a really boring summer, right? We're 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 crabbing along, going sideways. Do you think now that Bitcoin is adopted by these institutions, they also manipulate the price movement in a certain way, or like what's your what's your view on that? No, I, I don't. I don't think there's there's price manipulation. I do think that you know. People have these kind of questions because of the history of, of Bitcoin. And we're like, I mean, really recent history too. When you look at FTX went back bankrupt in 22 and they had notionally a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And then, oh, lo and behold, they went bankrupt and they didn't own any Bitcoin. <laughs> so they're, they're all, all of their, the people that had accounts at FTX were essentially, they were being screwed and they were holding paper promises for nothing. But I do not think that these ETFs operate this way. I mean, there's just a world of difference between the, you know, the auditing, the professionals, the, the actual, the quality of the individuals, the quality of the institutions involved when you're talking about BlackRock and Vitality versus, you know, we're talking about a, a startup in the Bahamas like, like FTX was. So no, I don't think there's price manipulation going on. I just think that people feel like that because people are frustrated with the price. I mean, the price is chopping sideways for six months and it's, it's a bit disappointing if you're kind of an obsessed holder. But no, I don't, I, don't, I don't see really any reason to think there is price manipulation going on. And what do you think about this uh, proof of reserves question? I think it was Fidelity that shared or was it Van Eck that shared uh, actually, the uh, Bitwise actually? Or Bitwise, um, yeah, yeah. So they they have their their reserves and like they they've done a proof of reserves and you know I I do think that would be nice to see or you know and and look another step would be just having a bit more differentiation between the custodians because the reality is most of the custodians or most of the ETFs are using Coinbase as a custodian. So I do think we'd be in a, a better position if the industry wasn't so heavily reliant on, on Coinbase. So yeah, I mean, look, I think it would be great to see proof, proof of reserves, but I can also understand why like Coinbase don't want to do it because it's just a hassle for them and they don't really have the, they, they don't really have the, you know, the benefit, I guess. But yeah, yeah, I just asked, to- yeah because I, I had the idea that once, you know, we, we talk about game theory in all these different ways in general in Bitcoin, right? Like I thought that you know, once one, one, uh, ETF issuer would publish their proof of funds that the others would do that too, right? Like I see it as, as a marketing tactic in a sense, right? Like it, it creates trust. So I'm actually quite surprised that there hasn't really been like a bigger push on the other issuers to actually do that. Yeah. Well, I think what that tells you is that most people are assuming that they're not being robbed by these institutions, which, you know, is, kind of standard operating procedure when you're looking at look if you buy if you're buying the s&p 500 through a blackrock index most people are not like going through and checking the custodial arrangements of the you know underlying share certificates of the s&p 500 mm-hmm. they're just assuming it's there and it's all kosher and you know i think that's that that's the reality of what we're seeing when you're looking at these these bitcoin etfs these are just traditional financial instruments and yeah. they're being treated that way by most most players. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. 
the Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Well, for me, it's logical because it's also actually possible with Bitcoin, right? I mean, the, the, the discussion around actual ownership and stuff, uh, you know, property of having property of, of, of stocks, I think is a different discussion. But just the fact that it's possible, you know, I don't know, like just from my perspective, I think, I think they should utilize it. But yeah, m- maybe, maybe we'll get there later on. I think I would, mm-hmm. I would, I would be an advocate for, for that, especially for, for these issuers to, to differentiate themselves. But, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's see how th- how that goes. Do you do you think in general that the ETFs could be a threat? Like you know, I don't know, government connections of BlackRock or just in general the creation of a huge honeypot over at at Coinbase. What? Well, uh, I think actually yesterday there was a FBI statement on North Korea trying to not directly hack the honeypot, right? But uh, they're doing some social engineering apparently. <laughs> Yeah. So like, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. I mean, yes and no. Yeah. But to the extent to which property rights are, are at threat, you know, in the, in the, like, if you're talking about the United States, which, which is what we're talking about with these ETFs, there's always a threat that, the, you know, the government goes into full blown communism and, and steals all your property. But to the extent to which you think, you know, that's not going to happen, which I think is a pretty fair, fair assessment then I wouldn't really be concerned as a, as a holder of, of these ETFs. Particularly when you, when you think about the people that investing in, you know, if they're using your IRA or you're using your, your pension funds or, or something like that, it's like, if, if it's no more of a threat than any other kind of financial instrument that you're holding. It's, it, it could all be theoretically taken by the government. Right. So you, that's, that's kind of the system you, you, we, we exist within. So it's, it's a no, it's, so I don't think it, I don't think it's a serious, serious threat, but I do think that, you know, if you want to sort of plan for, well, you know, if you're kind of a prepper, like you want to plan for the case when the government is going to, you want to flee, flee the country. Well, okay. Well, that's why, that's why you don't, that's why maybe you want to hold your assets within like a, you know, self custody of this thing, so you can take your take your Bitcoin with you. But you you got to think about who's buying these ETFs. Like it's it's just not it's 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 not really an issue if you're you've got your money in an IRA or you've got your money in a pension fund or it's or it's an insurance company buying them something like they're not worried about this kind of stuff. Like it's a complete it's a complete non issue. And in fact, this is why. It's valuable that it's, this is why it's important as a US ETF, right? Because some other country could do a, US, a an ETF, but you don't trust that country as much as you trust the US, which is like, that's the kind of the, 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 the standard bearer for property rights in the world. Yeah. I think the question comes more from, you know, I, I, I think the comments about, so, so I'm not personally not that clear on it, but I think, you know, what, uh, I think the idea is good that we get into this traditional finance space, right? I do see Bitcoin as a Trojan horse, but, you know, and that's a very good thing, I think. But I think like on the other side, the fact that, you know, I don't really know how people use the word co-opted, right? I don't think Bitcoin can be co-opted by, you know, being bought by institutions, being put in an ETF, etc. I think... And that's where the proof of reserves thing, I, I think, also comes in. You know, they they would be able to create paper Bitcoin. And although the people that would buy this paper Bitcoin, you know, obviously don't understand the real Bitcoin, and they didn't and they didn't do the work. But I do see it as a distraction for like just general adoption and the education of people around Bitcoin. So I think it's more that the question about that, like because you adjust to a sh- to a certain yeah type of product that is already there. Could that eventually be because of the nature of Bitcoin, because of the the fact that it can exist totally outside of this system where, you know, 
any other asset that would be in an ETF could not. Yeah, yeah those well, are kind of my thoughts around that. I hear you, but I, I, I sort of maybe got two responses to that. I mean, the thing about it is, is that these ETFs are attracting capital that doesn't necessarily have a use for that sovereign individual use case. But if you think about a pension fund or an insurance fund or a bank or a, a college endowment or any kind of really financial institution, there is no concept of self-custody. Like it, 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 it doesn't actually, it's kind of a non sequitur to say a, a institution has got self-custody of the coins because the end user doesn't have self-custody. They're still relying on the custody of the institution. So if I'm like, you know, if I'm part of the, if I'm a pensioner with the Wisconsin Pension Fund, whether the Wisconsin Pension Fund uses a BlackRock ETF to buy Bitcoin or whether they, you know, the board of the Wisconsin Pension Fund, they hold, you know, they have like a seven of 12 multi-sig set up to self-custody the coins. Ultimately, I'm, I'm not custodying it as a, as a pensioner, you know, and I, and I don't have any of the sort of ancillary benefits that come from, you know, I'm not a sovereign individual. I'm not, I cannot take this with me overseas. I cannot do anything like that. I am essentially using them as custodians for my coins, regardless of it. And the reality is, is that like an enormous proportion, dare I say, most of the capital in the world is tied up in these institutions like that. You know, yes, every person has this kind of a bank account in which they can take some money and buy some Bitcoin with it. But when you look at people's wealth, that's not where most people's wealth is. It's in their pension funds or it's in their, it, it, it's all of this capital that exists outside, you know, it, well, firmly embedded within the, the financial system. And from that perspective, the best thing for any, like if, if you're a Bitcoiner is the creating a kind of slippery, easy path avenue for capital to find its way to Bitcoin. And it doesn't really matter whether they custody, how they custody it, because you, you're not, you know, all you're getting is price exposure in any way. If you, you know, if you're a, like you're a student of the, at, at Harvard, you, you don't get any benefits with the Harvard Endowment Fund self custodies to Bitcoin. Ultimately, you get benefit, you might get benefits if the, if, if the fund does well and they can spend it on the school, whatever. But you see, you see the point I'm making, right? It's only price exposure for all of this capital. That's all that really matters. Yeah. It's, it's interesting now that we're talking about this. Like I, I, I think for myself that like I don't really have. A strong opinion about the ETFs in general. Like, I think it's interesting that it's happening. I think it's interesting that, you know, probably the most successful ETF launch in, in history, which is, I think, telling. I, I just hope that, you know, what I think are the effects of adopting Bitcoin will also actually happen. Right. So, for example, that the fact that business model wise, it should hopefully be enough for these institutions to just get fees from, from their AUM. You know, and not be incentivized to to fuck around in any way. You know, again with paper Bitcoin or or whatever. Like eventually, I think that will resolve itself because there cannot be really fake Bitcoin proof of reserves, all these things. But I think it could stall or impact. You know, general adoption or the perception of Bitcoin stuff like that. But yeah, let's just see. Let's just see how that how that plays out. Yeah, well, look, the, the, the other thing I would say to that, and look, I, I've thought about these questions myself, and I would just say, if if this is the, if an ETF, if approving the ETF was, is the kind of thing that is really the thing that kind of kills Bitcoin because it allows this paper Bitcoin and we don't get any kind of proliferation of any, or people actually holding the underlying asset and the 21 million concept is blown up because it's all paper. If they can kill Bitcoin that easy, then Bitcoin was, as a, as a project was doomed to fail immediately. Like it was, it was never going to succeed. You know, if, if, if it's that easy to kill Bitcoin, then, you know, forget about it. I, I don't think, I don't think it is like, I don't think it's really a big problem because I do think that the vast majority of Bitcoin is self custody and Bitcoin tends to, kind of expose any kind of paper situations pretty quickly or well maybe not quick as quick as we want but over time it does 
And what I would also say is that, you know, we can create systems where people have the right incentives. I don't think when you look at the people managing these institutions, they don't want to end up like Sam Bankman free. People don't want to go to jail for, for the rest of their life. So I don't think they have the actual incentives of the system to kind of cheat or do anything dodgy in terms with respect to, you know, creating fake, fake Bitcoin. I think your first point is a very valid point. Also, I think in general, when you think about threats to Bitcoin, threats to the adoption, co-opting, et cetera, like, yeah, you should still, you, you know, you have to study bit, Bitcoin to build your conviction, but you st should still view it as an experiment, right? And I think the experiment either goes to zero or it goes to, you know, everything, the black hole value, all the value in the world will be stored in Bitcoin. I personally don't think there's a middle way, but I think you're your point substantiates that in the, with the fact that, yeah, Bitcoin should be anti-fragile enough for anyone to adopt it, for anyone to try to play any game with it, et cetera. Like that's the entire premise or, or not the promise, the premise, I think, of what this technology could bring, right? So yeah, I think that's a good point to just view any counter arguments also like that. So yeah, there's probably some substance in counter arguments, but I think this is a valid outlook on that. So th that's a pretty interesting comment you made about that Bitcoin sort of subsumes all value. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement. I don't know if I necessarily, I don't know if I initially believe that's going to happen, but I'm curious why you don't think there's a world in which Bitcoin is, I don't know, 10% of all assets or, 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 or a middle ground. You see what I'm getting at? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it depends on the time horizon, right? Like that, that's obviously very hard to, uh, to predict. Why I think this is the case is I think with almost all characteristics of a good store of value. So storing your economic energy over time and space, Bitcoin is superior on multiple fronts to any other of these possibilities. So I think it's kind of, it's funny because I never say, <laughs> I don't think hope is a strategy, but I, I hope people will eventually figure this out and they all have to do that for themselves. I think that's why we should never stop talking about Bitcoin because eventually if we use Bitcoin for that purpose, it will also demonetize homes and land and stuff like that to eventually also create more accessibility for people to actually, I think homes are, are, are the best thing, the, the, the most important thing that we should fix, by the way. But yeah, I think it would have a big effect on that topic the housing for example in like specifically so yeah that's what i think like okay well if you get if bitcoin exists and it exists right and you are able to understand what it is and what its implications are if you have the problem right if you have money that you have to store somewhere you have economic energy that you have to store through time and space until whenever you want to use it and you have this range of options yeah i personally think bitcoin is the best option and i think that over time people will be forced not to ignore Bitcoin anymore. So they will have to be, you know, they are forced just because of his, its existence to take it in their options. And yeah, so I think over a long enough time frame, people will make the most logical conclusion. Yeah, look, I, I certainly think they're going to be a lot more valuable, but, and I agree with you about houses. I think houses are way overvalued because they've been monetized. And I think Bitcoin takes that monetization. But I do think no matter what, we're still going to have a world of, you know, the concept of a, a company, a business that makes oh, money. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. And, and that's going to, that's going to have value as well. I mean, if you have a cash flow generating business and you go, then it's, you know, if, if it's a business that m generates Bitcoin, you have to, you know, and then it comes back to the old fashioned discounted cash flow on the analysis on the, on the business. Funnily enough, actually, I think one of the reasons why all of those kind of old school methods of valuing a business based on, you know, your standard DCF. The reason why those have so gone so out of vogue now in, in some ways is that can't really, they, they assume you have kind of a stable system that you're a stable unit of, of measure. Like, Oh, how much is a business worth? If I, if I know how many dollars it's going to make over mm. the next you know, 20 years, I can, I can come out, come up with some kind of discount rate and have a valuation on it. But it gets really hard when you don't know what a dollar is going to be worth in, in, 
in 20 years time. That's, that's, yeah. that's the kind of the problem we're in. So I actually do think in some ways when you have like a really hard fixed unit, you know, this is talking in the future when you're using like Bitcoin, it's money, but you're going to have such a stable system. You know exactly what a Bitcoin is worth. And then it actually makes valuing businesses so much easier in a way because you can start to model and figure out, well, I want to make this many Bitcoin in 10 years, you know, o- over the life cycle of this business. And actually I can, I can actually value that because I know what if a Bitcoin in seven years time will be pretty, I can, I can quite reasonably estimate what that will be worth. Whereas right now we live in this massive state of uncertainty because, you know, you just have stuff happens. And, oh, it's a, it's a COVID pandemic and we've got to print 40% of the supply in, in 18 months and stuff like that happens. You just don't really know what, what a dollar is going to be worth. But I, I do think we're still going to have a world, no matter what, where oh, you're going to have these companies which are incredibly valuable. Yeah. So I don't know, like, that's, that's, of course, it's an open question about what Bitcoin is. And I guess the other thing I would say is sort of a question for you is, do you think there is a world in which Bitcoin is a digital gold? And, and what I mean by that is the kind of the payments layer scaling on Bitcoin at this stage in 2024 is theoretical. I would argue, I would say it's, it's a theoretical. We haven't figured out a way as a species to scale Bitcoin yet. Mm. We might. I hope we do. But we haven't figured it out yet. Not in a way that actually it's like strong yeah. network effects and strong adoption, but certainly the kind of gold, gold, digital gold mm-hmm. store of value use case. Clearly, you know, product market fit there is excellent, right? That's, there's no question. People love, I'm going to stick it in a box and I'm going to leave it there and it's a rock. And I'm going to leave it there forever. And it's going to be more value in 20, 20 years time. There, there's a huge product market fit for that use of Bitcoin. But do you think if, if you think that can be just a value alone if we don't get, yep. you know, the scaling system to it? I think also here the time frame is interesting, right? Like in which time frame would you think that is reasonable to happen. I don't have an answer to that. I do think that, you know, I, I do think in the, in the, in the concept of store of value before medium of exchange, like I should be able to store value in an asset before I would want to receive it for anything I do that creates value. So I think that is the, the path basically. I think the question that you're asking about eventually, you know, going to medium of exchange through, you know, whatever type of technology to eventually become money. I don't know if that is actually needed. So maybe, you know, the the idea of Bitcoin, you know, P2P cash eventually turns into something which I would say is way bigger because if, as I just alluded to before, if Bitcoin is the best store of value asset to ever exist that 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 in my mind is is a way bigger thing to achieve because if that is the best store value to ever exist and it will be used to value anything in the world then i think we also will achieve what we think bitcoin could achieve does that make sense like so whatever money people use it will always be measured against bit against bitcoin and I think the governments will still try to, you know, even if a euro dies or a dollar dies over a long enough time frame, they will come up with, you know, other currencies, even this uh, CBDC stuff. But but Bitcoin will act as a mirror for any of those attempts at creating money because it's clear that Bitcoin is the best thing to to ever own. So even if you have, let's say you are forced to use a CBDC, right? And you think, well, it's funny because they're in, in Europe, there's going to be a max that you can save in the CBDC. So it's not even following the definition of money, right? But let's mm-hmm. say you would want to say, okay, well, you know, I got some of this uh, e-euro, digi-euro, whatever you want to call it, uh, because I did some consulting for you. And now I want to move it into Bitcoin because that's the best, you know, unit to or asset to store my energy through time and space. And then, you know, the computer is probably going to say no, because there's, there's probably not going to be a place where you can buy Bitcoin with your Euro CBDC. And I think that eventually over a long enough time frame, people will realize that that is a problem, you know, and yeah, 
what what happens next i think is hard to predict but i i do love what's that gresham's law right so eventually people will gravitate towards a better money a better asset to store value yeah, i i i think that eventually will play out you know like if you look back into history you know all these examples of all these different currencies that were clipped and created and manipulated mm -hmm. etc but they never had one a, a mirror so there there wasn't another alternative that that was worldwide permissionless, all these things, right? That would just always exist. So there wasn't an alternative for people to adopt. That's combined with, I think, you know, the digital information world, the internet, you know, podcasts, et cetera, like just the information, you know, learning about the fact that your, you know, the, the fiat currency of your country that you're forced to use is not even money. It's not not the best money. You know, when you put it in the bank, it's not yours. Like all these things were way harder to learn also before. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my idea. Uh, yeah, kind of my thought around that. Like I think Bitcoin is unstoppable. It will exist forever. And over time, people will realize that it's uh, su more superior than any other asset that you can hold or earn. And then I think it's just human. This is psychology taking over. People moving into that. And if there are if they are prohibited from doing so, then that effect of not going along with that, I think will be way bigger than, you know, in history, because you have all this information, you know, there is an, there is an alternative to what you're being forced to use. Well, there's no, yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that the, I mean, part of this, the, the beauty of like the memetics of Bitcoin is the simplicity of the 21 million fixed supply. Like it's really actually it's really easy to understand. Yes. Like it's really, it's really that, that very simplistic. Yeah, it's very simple. But what I what I wonder is if there is like the, you know the, the future is uncertain, right? And there's clearly like there's this path where Bitcoin has these kind of scalable layer twos to that it essentially gets to be used as currency. Or there's a path where it's digital gold. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a long-term savings vehicle. It's really good for like holding for years, but it's just not, it just doesn't move at the velocity that you use, you know, regular money for. And the reason why I bring that up is because I do think it's like in a world in which it's not the money, it's still really valuable. It's still incredibly valuable, but it's not, it has, it takes a different, like the terminal value of it is different than if it's the money of the, the entire world's money. You see what you see what? Yeah, I'm yes, at? yes, yes. I agree, but I don't think you can compare the current fiat money with Bitcoin as being money. So maybe that's an interesting thing to like think about, right? Like just okay. So the 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 the, the paper money that we have maybe in our wallets, right? Like that you could argue has final settlements, right? Like I give it to you, you give it you give it to me and then, you know, I have it, you don't, you don't have it anymore. But that doesn't take away the fact that that money, just those bills and those coins are still influenced by third party policy that is very unpre unpredictable, right? Like as you, as you shared before. And also if you look at its basic principles, it's detrimental to the value of those coins and, 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 and paper, right? Like the entire point is to devalue it with 2% a year. Like that, that, that is already the policy, right? Sure. So I think it kind of depends like where you get into this conversation at, at which level, right? Because if you say like, okay, there's this money in that in physical form does have final settlement, but it's still influenced by third, third party policy. That's very unpredictable and, and you know, and very complex and, and, and everything that's attached to that. Then you have this other thing, which is, yeah, just a set of rules that's being followed every 10 minutes and being confirmed that it's still followed every 10 minutes. I think that's what the simplicity of Bitcoin is, right? Mm -hmm. And the output of that is that it creates an economic constant that you can use to measure value in. And it has all these other properties of, you know, final settlement worldwide, all, all, all these things. So, and I'm thinking as, as I'm talking, but. I, I don't think they are comparable, comparable, right? So I, I also don't like it when people say like, oh, Visa is faster than Bitcoin or whatever. Like, yeah, like Bitcoin is a layer one. You know, Visa is a layer seven, right? So I also, I, I don't know where you would put fiat money, but fiat money is not on the same layer as 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 Bitcoin, right? Like eventually, yeah. So I, yeah, I'll, I'll think I'll just stop there. But I think 
I, I, I don't know if that comparison is fair. And I think a lot of people push on, you know, Bitcoin is a P2P electronic cash uh, system. Yes, I think that's the outlook. I also think you can use it like that. It's definitely not there yet, but we are in the phase before that. This store of value discovery, I would say, like uh, still, still discovering what is that worth? How does it compare to what we would deem as other store of values, but also how does it actually expose that some things that we deem as store of values are actually not store of values. We attempt to use them as store of values because the thing that's actually, actually should be the store of value, right? The, f- the fiat money, the money is not. So I think just the proliferation and monetization of Bitcoin is sh- showing the, the, that the entire construct of fiat money is flawed in very different ways. And that we have to pay attention to in each discussion, I'd say, like, where are we entering? At, at, at what level are we entering certain comparisons or promises or yeah, future outlooks? I'd say. Yeah, well, look, I, I really like that. Yeah, I mean, and it's hard. I was trying to explore here, don't necessarily have all of the answers. I mean, I do think Me that, neither. <laughs> I do think that, and you, you touched on this earlier and I'll, I would say whether or not Bitcoin ends up being a kind of a currency of the world, we all like an interesting question is what's the definition of success for Bitcoin? Like what, what, you know, what, what is enough? What, what would make you think in a hundred years of time it succeeded versus not succeeded? And I, I have one that I, I like to think about or which is that, you know, I think one of the biggest problems of our financial system is this, there's a negative externality that comes with the fact that people can't store their wealth in, in, in sort of traditional financial system, or they can't use cash, basically. They can't use, they can't save, essentially. So they, they then, the only reasonable approach is to then store your wealth in property. Which is, which is certainly the best idea of the 20th century, buy a house. But I think it's created a world in which property prices, because of that, have, you know, they have a valuation which has become completely disconnected from their utility when it comes to actually like, you know, providing a roof over, over somebody's head and, and providing protection from the weather and actually just like the basic fundamental human needs we have for property. So we have this big problem where people need the, you know, humans, we need like a place to live. We need it, but we also want to, we also want to store our wealth in something. And the two things have been completely intermingled with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's got all these negative consequences because all these people that don't need it for the savings, but do need it for actually just like a place to live they're priced out and it creates all this financial insecurity and it and it has all these downstream negative effects on society like people because they don't know where they're going to live don't have a safety net they're not even sure if they can start a family and it has all these kind of detrimental effects on the world so i would say if we say we if bitcoin is able to effectively replace the housing market as a tool of savings, as a tool of wealth protection, and kind of disconnect the like place to live as a savings tool, that would be the biggest and most beneficial outcome for the world. And then, you know, if Bitcoin does these other things related to, you know, providing fast fast payments over the internet, that would be that would or that would be great too. When you know, when it comes to kind of real world payments, I'm actually not that concerned about it because, like, at least where I live, right? I'll just be honest when I tell you that the UX for like buying a cup of coffee in, in Australia is really good. Like, I just tap my card and bang, mm. it's done. There's not like a huge problem there. Like, Same. Bitcoin can solve some big, big problems for us in terms of savings and fixing the housing market, fixing the store of value is, and there are some kind of payment systems and stuff that could be fixed and de- depending on which country you're in. You know, if you're in a third world, you might have some like real needs that I don't personally have, but I, I do, for me, 
if I'll, if I, if I, if Bitcoin is this savings tool of the world in a hundred years time, that's a huge success. The payment stuff, you know, I, I, I think that's an open question because nobody's necessarily figured out a way. Like we haven't figured out a way to create, you know, scalable layer twos that are, that are adopted. We have the lightning network. It's not, it doesn't have adoption. Like it's, there's no adoption. I mean, maybe there's not no adoption, but it's not, it's not widely adopted. Uh, and we're, you know, th- and this is a, this is a network that was conceived of almost a decade ago, this lightning network. So it's not like it's, you know, people can say we'll be patient. So, yeah. Well, okay. But how many decades do we have to wait for the lightning network? Yeah. Uh, I, I think my first thought to to this is it's really hard to put the fixing of money and everything that comes with that, like you know the the the, the co opting of real estate as a store of value instead of a utility asset is of course a horrendous thing. The the fact that that happened is already a huge problem, right? So and and, and money permeates through everything. Yeah, my, my last episode was with Seb Bunny and you know, you also know the term like everything is downstream of money. Like that is just really the case. It touches everything that we do. It touches our psychology and the time preference, all these things. And so I think I I don't disagree with what you say about payments and the technology, but I also think that, you know, you and I are totally into this thing and it's very lo- it would be very logical that, you know, payments would already work and all these things. But I think we are trying to fix the money, you know, (laughs) which almost sounds, I think it's the biggest undertaking that has been done, not necessarily by you and me, but just by the technology Bitcoin and anyone trying to advocate for that. Right. So although I don't disagree with you, I would counter that with like, what is your expectation? So yes. I, you know, it's a, it's a logical idea, but 99% of people in the world still don't own Bitcoin, right? So you were talking about payments to get coffee while we perhaps should still be talking about the fact that the money is broken, maybe for the next 10 years or until it blows up before that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, look, Bitcoin takes on all these different kind of narratives depending on, you know, at, at, at a moment in time, a certain narrative is going to create the kind of adoption for for people. I mean, there's always the, the underlying narrative is obviously the bank bailouts, money printing. I mean, it was inscribed into the first block by Satoshi, the the, the, the bank bailout. So that, that's always going to be the kind of maybe the fundamental narrative behind it. But at the same time, there'll be a lot of different reasons why people might adopted and it could be it could be like protection from it could be protection from inflation but you know other people are going to look at it and come at it from like a the traditional financial system and be like oh actually just look look at it as a performance enhancer for my portfolio you know how does the expected returns measure versus the volatility and what's the historical performance and how does it go in a bucket of assets and I think there's a lot of different re- like there's a lot of different ways people can kind of come at or will find their way into it and maybe it just kind of needs to fit the moment depending on like when when you get in, you know what gets you excited whether it is this kind of a potential internet money I mean that was also very much a meme the in a decade ago that was that was very much, whereas kind of the story changes over time so we don't really know where it's where that's going to go. I mean, I do, I do see all this kind of. I think it's really interesting when people talk about like AI and how, you know what's the money they're, they're going to use and like or, 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 you know and, and how are they going to be? They may, maybe they are going to be using like a, a lightning network, like using you know sending basically like zapping zapping SaaS to each other via <laughs> in exchange for tokens. And there's there's, there's going to be all kinds of weird narratives that come up again in the future as well so it's really hard to predict what it will be in a given moment it's fascinating to kind of watch that though play out like see what it is in the moment i do think in 2024 like the big thing of the of 2024 is these etfs and it's a store of value it's protection and it's, it's not even dare i say it's not even protection it's actually just it's literally like interest rate cuts are coming Bitcoin is the fastest horse. Bitcoin is going to enhance your portfolio. 
Like that's, I would say, the dominant storyline of Bitcoin right now, wouldn't you? Or how would you describe it? Yeah, I I think so too. I think it's just a, an extra testament to the importance of Bitcoin, the fact that five people adopted it, right? Like I'm not happy that the finance bros figured it out. But yeah, Bitcoin is in that sense for anyone. So I see I see it as huge validation for, for what it is. I I think it will stay this way, this this narrative, as you said, like through through this cycle, but also I I'm I'm a big proponent of the concept of AI using Bitcoin. I think there's no other currency that would fit an autonomous network of you know, a network of autonomous agents interacting with each other, sharing value in whatever way and getting paid for that. I I, I love that concept. Perhaps well last week I've been really diving into this like uh, uh, like uh, app web development with AI, you know, back end, front end, everything just just with prompts and I think it's mind blowing to see mm-hmm. like how far that already is. And with all these AI things that come out from time to time, I always think like, okay, it's only going to be better from here, which yeah, it's just mind blowing by itself, I think, because the experience is already pretty mind blowing. And then, you know, it's only going to be better than that. So I also wouldn't be surprised if, 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 if someone or something would actually create certain open source code library or instructions or agents that can actually help you monetize, well, your agents and use Bitcoin as a currency to, to do so. You know, like there's, I think a good example is that there's a lot of these products that revolve around data, for example, right? Like there are people that sell million dollar spreadsheets, right? Like access to million dollar spreadsheets. And I kind of see these GPT agents in the same way. Like, let's say you have some proprietary data that, that you're selling. Now you can actually put a utility layer on top of it, which is, you know, a custom GPT or a custom AI agent for that data. Mm-hmm. Selling access to that, I think would, would make a lot of sense to do that in, in Bitcoin. And then you have like an autonomous money making value creating machine, basically. So yeah, I'm quite excited about that. But yeah, with regards to that narrative, this is something that I wanted to ask you because there's a lot of things happening this year. But yeah, first I wanted to ask you like, what's your, what's your idea about like price scenario, supply shock, stuff like that? I see you post a lot on Twitter, of course, about like ETFs, bought this amount of money, this amount of Bitcoin, you know, this is more than the daily production. You see, I think last week there was like 40,000 Bitcoin that was withdrawn from Binance. In general, the, the supply is very low on exchanges. So what's, what are your thoughts around that? Well, look, I would say that there are probably three kind of potential catalysts for you when you look at that. that I mean, I'd say there are more, maybe more than three, but three that are like are kind of obvious of the next six months. First one is you've got the U.S. election. Coming up, right? So, I mean, that's actually very obvious and very clear. Trump has explicitly said they're going, they're going to create a strategic reserve of Bitcoin, or essentially, we're not going to sell what we already have. But he's just, he's essentially giving the market the green light on Bitcoin. So, if, if he gets in, I have no doubt Bitcoin will at least benefit temporarily. You know, there'll be a short term burst if if Trump wins, and you know. I, I, I think that sentiment will be will be worse if Kamala wins. So we'll, we'll we'll watch that and see how that plays out. I think that there is maybe more importantly this sort of Fed cycle that's coming up. So you know everybody expects rates to be cut cut in in, in the next meeting. Is it twenty five basis points? Is it fifty basis points? And maybe more importantly, what's the language around what's you, you know expectations for next year? Right, because. Even when you look at this year, Bitcoin hasn't had the year. It's, it's had an okay year. I mean, it's up thirty percent or something, but it's you know it's been a pretty dull year for Bitcoin. I think it's fair to say, and I think part of that is that going into the year, the market was expecting a lot of rate cuts to come and a lot earlier, and they just haven't happened, right? So people have to you know the market reprices the fact that you know if the dollar's paying five percent yield, well. And if that affects something versus a zero percent yielding asset in Bitcoin, it just it just changes the behavior. So, and notwithstanding, like the, the cost of debt and all that is much higher with interest rates a lot higher as they are. So, with the, the with the cost of debt gets lower, more debt, more money, 
more liquidity, more flows into Bitcoin. It's actually pretty simple stuff. That is the next big one. And I think the third one that's actually like maybe under talked about, but it's the kind of the flip side of this bearish Mt. Gox coins we've had over the past few months is that FTX are returning a whole bunch of cash to their holders, like, like 15 billion, 16 billion that's expected to come in Q4 this year. And that's not coming. That's not Bitcoin coming onto the market. That's like dollars coming onto the market and dollars coming to literally crypto holders. I mean, that's, that's what FTX creditors are, right? So you, you're sending out 16 billion to crypto holders. I would imagine, I think it's fair to assume some proportion of that will find its way back into the crypto market and some proportion of that will find its way back into Bitcoin. So you could easily imagine that's like 3 billion of buying pressure right there. So those are kind of the three obvious catalysts, if you'd like. And then maybe the fourth one, I guess, is we've had this halving six months ago. And, you know, historically, it's taken a bit of time for the halvings to to take their effect. And they do have a kind of a supply squeezing effect of basically every month, that you can uh, one one way to think about it is is like twelve thousand Bitcoin less mined every month. So yeah, in one month it's like okay twelve thousand Bitcoin, but over a quarter that's you're looking at forty thousand Bitcoin. So as these quarters start to roll on, the effect of the halving in terms of you know re- reducing the supply of Bitcoin onto the market increases. So I do think that's likely to take effect coming next year and. You know, also this year, we just had all these kind of exogenous things that have just like added Bitcoin to the market. We had GBTC selling 400,000 Bitcoin. We, well, maybe not 400,000, but 350,000 Bitcoin. We've had Germany selling 50,000 Bitcoin. We've had, we've had, you know, US have sold some Bitcoin. We've had all these kind of exogenous shocks, kind of on the negative side, actually, a lot of them that you're just not expected to see next year in terms of the supply of Bitcoin on the market. So if we just get a little bit more, dare I say, luck when it comes to not having these random events where an extra 100,000 Bitcoin gets added to the market, you might actually see that kind of supply shortage, dollar excess, and you know that can kind of create this kind of reflexive loop where Bitcoin hits a new all-time high, People start chasing it and you get to see, you know, we get to see the the fireworks again, which I think we're all looking forward to. Yeah. So are there any price predictions you have for this cycle, like in, in, in the next, uh, I don't know, 12, 12 to 18 months or something? And, and do you have any reasoning behind that? Uh, yeah, well, look, I think I think one thing to watch is, that's kind of interesting is when you look at historically what it's done relative to the 100 week moving average or what, well, what relative to the cost of mining the Bitcoin. And maybe that, maybe that latter one is actually really important because when you look at the publicly traded miners, they're mining at like 30K right now. And you're going to need a, if you just, just a sort of a frame of reference in 2021, they were mining at 6K when the price was 60. So you can see a really big divergence, but historically you get a big divergence and then it kind of the, the prices start to converge on one another, as was as we're seeing now, where you know Bitcoin price is, you know, 55, 60, but there's usually, you know, it's only sort of twice what the miners are paying for it, the micro cost of miners. So now the reason why I bring that up is to say that kind of tells you there's like a cap on how high it can go depending on how high the hash rate goes, like what are we looking at? If, if Bitcoin is costs $60,000 to mine this time next year, I would tell you that no matter how hard the Bitcoin bull run rips, you're going to struggle to see it sustain, you know, over that kind of that gold level, like 500,000 level. And I'm not saying we're going to hit, hit 500,000 in the next year and a half. I'm just trying to Get a reasonable kind of like, hey, it looks, it's going to be looking real toppy if, if, if the, the price is 10x what the mine, if what it costs the miners to produce. And then likewise, you can look at, you know, 200 week moving average, which is now say 40k. And that can generally in a bull market get five, you know, five times, if not more, you know, sort of what the, 
what that 200 week moving average is. So what that tells me basically is that if we get a bull run, I think we could see it in the, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands, but you can kind of, I don't, I don't necessarily see it. Like, I guess, I guess I don't necessarily see kind of a, a run, you know, maybe like a 2013 run or something like that. Like, I do think there's probably a natural cap on it, depending on, you know, how much the hash rate goes and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I don't, I, look, who knows what's going to happen. I, I expect a good, a good run in the next 18 months. I expect, I expect we'll see multiple hundreds of thousands, whether it's, whether a Bitcoin price top set. I don't know. It could be 160 or it could be 400. I don't know, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but that, that, that's, that's kind of, you know, roughly what I'm thinking. Yeah, I am still questioning this idea of diminishing returns. Like I see, I see Bitcoin as a, as a mind virus. And, and I think I shared it before in this conversation. Like, yeah, if, if you are interested and you study and at one point you can, you should come to the conclusion, you will probably get to the conclusion that there's nothing better to own than Bitcoin, right? Like that's not a hopey type comment. I, I, I think that's a realistic assessment of, of Bitcoin itself. And I think that will take a lot of time because it isn't this individual mind virus, but eventually more and more people and also institutions, they, they will eventually, you know, first diversify in it. I think that's one. And then over time, you know, that, that, that percentage allocation will will also grow. And because it grows, people are more interested and they learn more about it, et cetera. So yeah, I, I don't, I, again, I think it's interesting that this concept of time frame, right, com, comes back. Like, I don't know if that's this cycle, but it, it, it will happen. I think. The one thing I would say to you though, is that when you say there's nothing better than owning Bitcoin, even if I like, let's say like, Let's say I agree. To store my so, value, by the way, wait to add because we mentioned how, how homes before, sure. right? Or, uh, or you mentioned like businesses, right? To invest, like that's investment. This is savings, right? And so, or at least now I look at it as as, as savings. But it's just the best thing. It's the best thing to own right now to save what whatever you have gathered. And because over time, more people will figure that out. That's why the price per unit will be going up. That's kind of my, the, the concept of, of reference for me. I agree with the fundamental thesis, but here's, here's my point I would add to keep in mind, because I think there's another layer, which is very important. Let's imagine, you know, there is a reason why Bitcoin can't just run off to $10 million tomorrow. And it's because even if you accept the framing that Bitcoin is by far and away the best thing, the reality is, is that let's say price was $5 million for Bitcoin tomorrow. And you, and you are like, well, all I want to do is own Bitcoin. Your best incentive though, in that situ- situation is, well, I'm not going to buy Bitcoin. I'm going to buy Bitcoin miners because then I can acquire Bit- Bitcoin much cheaper. And so you have this kind of relationship where if the price gets too high, nobody, and, and if you have a rational market, nobody will buy it. Because they, they might, they might accept all I want is Bitcoin. They might accept the logic of that. But if the price of the market price of Bitcoin far and outweighs the uh, cost of producing it, all the capital will flow into mining it. And then, and then the problem is, is that if, if that happens, if the, if the capital flows into mining it and not into buying it on the spot, then the spot price comes down. So there's always, you know, a relationship between the cost of mining it and the, the spot price. So that's why, you know, and you can have a situation we might like in the, the sort of the Goldilocks situation is both are exploding all at once, mm. in which case, yeah, it can go really high. But what we've seen historically is that they kind of, the, there's a lead lag effect. Like for example, right? 2017, Bitcoin price exploded right to 20K. If you look at 2018, the hash rate 5X during 2018, the price fell by 75% in 2018. So what was happening in the market was every a lot of people were going, yeah, I want some Bitcoin, but nobody's buying it. <laughs> Everybody was flooding in to buy the miners. And so, and, and, and that's my point with, you know, what can happen? Like, there's, that's why there's this kind of like, well, we have to see what happens to the hash rates to figure out how high it can go. And I agree with you as well. We're talking about a local potential local high because 
you know, in 10 years time, it's going to be so much higher, right? It's, it's, we're going to laugh at the 2025 price, whatever it is. And we're going to, it's going to be laughable in 2035. It's going to be like, oh, you've got the opportunity to buy in 25. It's insane. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, but, I think so. Yeah. But again, yeah. this is kind of like, where, where are you kind of entering this discussion and, and in, in what outlook? But I, I started this because I asked the question about the next 18 months. So I think that's your, your answer is more valid here, but I think it's interesting, right? I think it touches also upon eventually time preference. Like what are your expectations? How much do you understand it? Like in, in general, these are, are, are things that come back when you kind of talk about predicting where, where this can go. I think I, yeah, I stick, I try to stick with the fundamental concept of what Bitcoin is. And again, yeah, the hope, the hope, hope is not a good word, but I think like, I think that more and more people will figure this out, not only because more and more people will experience the problem of, you know, the broken fiat money system. Well, mainly because of that, I want to say. And, and then they will start asking questions. I, I, tr I don't have hope, but I trust in that, that people will do that. I know that not everyone will, will do that. I think that that would be utopia, but yeah, there, there is not really another option. I'd say like the other option for me, yeah, it's pretty dark. I would say like if, if, if people don't wake up to the fact that their time is stolen because their money is broken. And they're just blindly going to accept an inferior solution like CBDC, then we're like further away from where we're at now. Let me ask you this then. What are you going to think you know, if we're at the end of 2025 and Bitcoin price is 55K, 58K actually, let me say 58. What is that going to change your perception of Bitcoin? No, or, 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 no. no because objectively, it's, it, it, for me, it's the best thing to ever own. So fact that the price is at that level because other people don't understand. Yeah. I, I don't see as my problem. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, I know. I, I, yeah. And then what? Okay. It's 58. I'm so disillusioned with, you know, all the, how do you say like uh, expectations that I had because Thomas said on his podcast, you know, it's going to be 200 K. Yeah. No, like I, I, I think, I think that is what Bitcoin eventually teaches more in a psychological and spiritual way, <laughs> like, okay, can you still trust yourself? And if you think, well, this other person told me that it's going to be 200K and it's not, so now I'm going to sell it. You know, I'm just thinking sell for what? Like what? Back into what? But yeah, I don't know. It's not logical for me. Yeah, I agree with you. I do agree with you. And I think that you ha you kind of have to hold the competing ideas in your head at the same time. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't, like, I think Bitcoin price will be a lot higher. I yeah. agree with that, by the way. I think you should always keep the competing ideas. Mm. That, that's why I said, you know, you can think, okay, fuck it. I'm going to sell it because, you know, didn't reach what I thought or was told to me, right? I think that's why all these, a lot of people hate stock to flow model by plan B. You know, he said this and it didn't go there. So now it sucks. Or like, I don't know. I think that's weak, but. Anyway, you, mm. like you have to have the, no one knows what they're doing. No one has it figured out. I think that's healthy uh, attitude, right? So you are, we have a certain conviction on Bitcoin, not because another person told us like, oh, this is the best thing ever. No, I think because we took the time to study it. And that's why I say like, okay, if I have the thought that, you know, it's not at the price that I wanted it to be, I, I, to be honest, I don't really think like that, but let's say I would, then, you know, I instantly give myself the challenge of making a decision whether I would want to keep Bitcoin to store my value or sell it and acquire something else, right? And I think that's already where opposing or competing ideas show, right? Because then you have to start comparing it again to, you know, whatever you think you you should be in. So I think that's a healthy attitude in, in general. But yeah, for me, Bitcoin is just a very rational, yeah, conclusion to, to, to own it. Yeah, look, I, I agree with you. I do, I do think though, it's really interesting to think about part of the value proposition of Bitcoin is that it stores its value over time, right? I mean, that's, that's the inherent value proposition. So it does, it does like, it does beg the question. You know, one of the things that requires of it is it need, like, number go up is baked into this. It has to do that. Otherwise, it's not fulfilling its purpose. Exactly. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. showing that everything else is inferior, right? And that people will move towards it 
And that's why the yeah, price goes and, up. And, and if it's not doing that, then it's it's not accomplishing its purpose. Now, you know... That's I, true. I, I, sorry, I, sorry to add to that. That's true, but that doesn't change the thing. So just, just because the thing exists doesn't mean that people understand why it should exist, what the implications of it are, et cetera, right? So I, I also agree with you, but that doesn't say anything about the thing. It says something about access to information about it, understanding it, studying it, et cetera, right? I, 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 I could also argue against that then, well, then the value proposition is not clear enough. But then I would ask you, like, what would you compare it to, right? You don't compare it to, I don't know, some new AR, AI startup that solves a certain use case, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. If there's not enough people that have a problem around that use case, they will not adopt that AI tool as a solution, although it exists and maybe works flawlessly. I think Bitcoin touches a problem that everyone in the world has, but that almost none of the people are actually aware of. And that for me is a signal for why this is such a huge battle. That's the entire point, right? Like you have a problem, but that problem is abstracted away by propaganda from the people that created that problem. You know, like that, that's huge. That's not, you know, I'm looking for a new CRM system for my company or something like that. Something sure. like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mm-hmm. interrupted you. Sorry. So I don't know what you wanted to say. No, look, I think it's, I think it's, it's interesting. I, if, I think the value proposition is that Bitcoin goes up actually, it's like fundamental over a long, over a long period, but like, let's call it maybe 12, 12 months too short, but like a four year cycle. Like, it, it, you know, I would sit here and question things. If we're at the next halving and Bitcoin is trading at 58 K and I don't think that's going to happen. But if it is, it's something that's fundamental. Like, there's that's a huge narrative violation for Bitcoin in terms of serving its actual use, its value. And so, anyway, that I just it's just pontificating here because I don't think it really, I don't think it matters too much because actually, like the kind of the the maths of the fiat Ponzi versus the t- hard facts of the 21 million means, that, yeah, the number is going to go up, the price that is. Mm. But at the same time, you know, it, it's it's I don't like. Like I'm someone that says, you know, price actually does really matter. It's like, it's really important for Bitcoin. Like if the price isn't going up over a long period, right? Not, not this like days or weeks or months or even like the odd, a bad year is fine, but it needs to have, like, it needs to be going up over yep. a sustained period. Otherwise it's not working actually. So anyway, that's just a thought. I agree. I, I agree. Yeah. But again, yeah, again, it's the time frame, right? I think a 200 week moving average, I think is an interesting one, right? Like that's, uh, yeah. that's like, that's like four years. That's, that's up only, right? But yeah, no, I think, I think it's a very good challenging question to, to, to ask. And also, I think it's, just, it's so hard to answer because again, yeah, on what time frame should you judge challenging of the fiat money? I don't mm. know. Is, is that 15 years? Is that 20 years? Is that 40 years? I don't know. We, we have our generation, the generation below us to, I think, including everyone alive, I would say, has been mm-hmm. indoctrinated with the fiat money scheme. You know, it's, it, it's, it's part of our entire belief system around how we exchange value, how society works, but we never really questioned it. We never studied it. You know, people with a master master of economics have never studied or have been asked the question, what is money? So Mm -hmm. I think it's a huge, huge undertaking. So I like talking about this because I think we approach it in a rational way, but I always kind of come back to this point of like, okay, but what could, what, what is like an, an honest objective timeframe in which this should, should be supposed to happen or something? I don't, I just don't have the answer to that. Right. So sometimes I think certain questions sound like they are valid, but yeah, if you only look at 15 years, you know, then I don't think it's a valid question. Does that make sense? Right. So it could be that, that the same point is valid in 50 years. Yeah. Then, then we have a different conversation. Yeah. Look, I mean, I I don't know the answers either, but if anyone listening knows the answer, let us know, (laughs) let us, let us know. All right. I want to ask you uh, t- two more two more questions before we wrap this up. I think uh, one question I want to ask you. So my thought around you know 
BlackRock adopting Bitcoin, creating an ETF. I don't think it's only about making money. I think that could probably be like the primary reason, right? But, you know, these are winners of the TradFi system. They probably have abused it also in, in many different ways, right? I cannot imagine that they don't exactly know what this is. So that is my assumption. My assumption is, you know, okay, the finance bros have figured this out. And the leaders in the space, well, let's say BlackRock, like they know exactly what this is. They know how it acts as a mirror for fiat money, how it's uh, superior, all these things, right? I mean, there was even this internal report by BlackRock a few years ago. I don't know if you remember that, but it said like uh, the best allocation into Bitcoin in a portfolio is 84% or something. Yeah. And then, the, and then the rest, the 16%, you do 60, 40, like the, like the classic one. I think that's pretty mind blowing. Like I'm convinced that they know exactly what this is. But they are also big winners of, of the fiat money game. Let's, let's call it like that. Right. And one of my assumptions would be like the people that profit the most from the fiat money system will probably be the last to adopt Bitcoin. Right. Because they, they are in a place where they can abuse it until people just don't accept it anymore. But what I find interesting is that BlackRock has one leg in the fiat money system and they have one leg in this Bitcoin system. And when I see someone like Larry Fink on TV and I see him talk, I think like that's not a guy that gets talking points and then written by someone else and then starts talking, right? So if you listen to him, it sounds like he understands it, right? So that's kind of where my idea around that comes from. And the question, the point that I want to make is, do you think that eventually this could be like a speculative play on the dollar like Soros did with like the Bank of England? Like, let's say... You know, you said mathematically, you know, the debt in America is only going up. The debt payments are only going up. Productivity is going down. Like this is not heading in the right direction, right? Mm -hmm. And let's assume that someone like BlackRock or Larry Fink knows that this is definitely going to happen. So let's say at one point, no one wants U.S. Treasuries anymore. The dollar implodes, etc. And the American government is like, damn, okay, Larry, I need that. Uh, we need that. We need those Bitcoin. Right, the entire global game theory starts playing. We need those Bitcoin, and then BlackRock or Larry will be like, "Well, f f you, I'm in charge now." That's kind of my uh, <laughs> my thought here. What what do you what do you think about this? Like, I just think it's fascinating that they're in both of these worlds, and yeah. the one world is heading towards Im implosion. Look, I, I think that it comes down to a level of conviction, which is, I would say, that they're not. Even Larry isn't, he's not at brand Not a Bitcoin level. Maxi yeah. Ultra. No, I don't. No. Yeah. no, I think that there's this idea. I think people get that, like, first of all, the chart is undeniable, right? So just the chart is undeniable for anybody to look at that. You have to be, you, you know, if you especially put on a log, a log chart, you look at 15 years of, of the Bitcoin history, you, 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 you can't, look at it and come up come up away with any other conclusion other than like you know this is something special and it's not going away it's 15 years and it's not going away and so anybody reasonable comes to that conclusion so yes all those financial professionals they all they all come to that conclusion and then you know obviously do they understand the fact that it's like actually really simple stuff you know the 35 trillion in debt the fact that the US is whether or not it enters a debt spiral or not Ultimately, even the budget office is coming out and saying they're going to have 50 trillion in debt by the end of the decade. Like everybody knows, everybody knows they're on a fiscal path to printing to oblivion. Like that's just a given. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that Bitcoin, you know, you have to believe in Bitcoin to believe that Bitcoin really benefits, but everybody can see the problem that Bitcoin could theoretically serve. So do I think they see that? Yes, for sure. But also, they just, more importantly, I would argue they're just trying to make money. And, and, and I do think that. And that's kind of the cool thing because the incentives are aligned anyway. So the fact that all they really want to do is make money, but it serves Bitcoin's purpose, that's awesome. The reason why you can kind of tell, like, it's pretty clear to me they're trying to, yeah, they're just, you know, for making money. is they, they would happily do a Solana ETF. They would happily do a Ripple ETF. They would happily do a Cardano ETF. I agree. Yeah, that's a good they, point. They, you know, they're not... Mm. They're not like looking at Bitcoin as, you know, they're just like, oh, there's demand for that asset and we can, we can clip it a little bit and serve a purpose. And so I, I think that's probably, you know what? I think that's fine. Like 
this yeah, I think yeah. that's also fine. But that, but then, so yes, good point. But then I think like, but then they don't understand Bitcoin. And so my, the first premise, first, my first principle is like, okay, they understand what Bitcoin is and the implications. And yeah, you can do an ETH, Solana, whatever. But then that then kind of signals like you don't really, <laughs> you don't really understand it. So yeah, I don't know. It's just, I'm just posing something, right? Like it sure, seems well, like they get it, but I think it's a mix. I mean, you look at the Van X CEO. He's 30% of his portfolio is in Bitcoin. So that tells me he's got a pretty high level of conviction in what Bitcoin is and what it can, what, what it's going to be. I mean, we don't know the extent to which a guy like Larry Fink is, you know, going heavily into Bitcoin. But the one thing I would say is, is that, you know, they will show their conviction to me. I'll believe it when I see, you know, they have these model portfolios for their, for how they invest in a balanced fund. When I see them putting Bitcoin in their model portfolios and having a significant allocation to Bitcoin, that's when I'll believe they really believe it. Until they, you know, have a, until they're allocating their fund to Bitcoin, I don't necessarily see the conviction. And they might be doing a slow play here. I mean, one, one of the interesting things, just going full circle here, but you, we, at the start of the, you know, the start of this chat, we talked about how BlackRock's basically had zero outflow days. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that, it means that there's basically no days where there's massive excess selling relative to the buying. But we know on a market, it's almost like, where are all the buying coming from on a day when like, you know, Fidelity sold $160 million worth of Bitcoin today. Like the price was dropping, fear was everywhere, investors were selling. So why isn't that happening with BlackRock? Well, one of the plausible situations is that BlackRock is kind of mopping up the selling and they're going, uh, BlackRock. Uh, that's what I think. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's. I would very, do that too. Of course. Yeah. They're probably on days when the investors are selling, mm -hmm. uh, uh, are selling the, you know, the BlackRock, the entity is going, all right, we'll buy the Bitcoin from you. Yes. I, I, agree. I and, and so maybe that is happening and maybe they are building their own kind of position to be announced later down the track. I, it, well, that, this is speculation. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't really know what's happening. But it's a but very rational. This is what I like, right? If you understand what this is, and I think they understand what this is, like, even if you look at that report, very clear that they understand what this is. Then, you know, this is always a fun thing to keep that I try to keep my ego in check, right? Like, we think this is a logical thing to do. It makes a lot of sense. And I always think like, I cannot imagine that people who work there don't think the same. Right. I don't think I have figured this out, you know? Yeah, I don't believe that. So it, it makes a lot of sense to suck up the volume that's being sold by the ETF holders to not only keep the appearance of inflows, you know, it's like a marketing ploy, but also to build your 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 own stack because they have plenty of money and they would want to do that because they know exactly what this thing is. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a plausible scenario and I probably, to be fair, should have added that on the list of like really bullish potential catalysts going forward. Like, you know, the day they announce, oh yeah, we're putting Bitcoin in our model portfolio. Oh, and by the way, we already own 50,000 Bitcoin and yeah, exactly. yeah, the price yeah. is going to spike up massively. So it, mm -hmm. it does make sense that they would be kind of secretively stacking if they were to kind of take that strategy or have yeah. that opinion. So that, that, that is, that is a pretty interesting theory. But yeah, we'll see. That's why this is so entertaining, don't you think? <laughs> In general, Bitcoin. All right. Last question. Then almost 90 minutes, dude. I maybe see how short you can keep this. This is a good, sure. this, is a, this is a fun exercise. What are your thoughts on global game theory? Like countries mining, accepting Bitcoin. Like, do you think, I personally think that the line for kicking this off is very, very, very thin. You know, any mm -hmm. serious country that would announce 5 billion in Bitcoin will probably become the richest country in the world, but they will also kick off the global game theory. And then uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, it's been really interesting that El Salvador kind of did it, I guess, and it didn't, to be fair, it didn't kick off the game theory that maybe people thought it would in terms of, mm. there is a first mover, right? There's a bit El Salvador and it hasn't, it hasn't been the followers. Yeah, I think the follower will win more than El Salvador. Yeah, look, I, I, I think what matters is it's not just about whether someone does, but whether it's the who. I mean, the day, you know, if US actually does, I mean, there's literally a bill 
p- passed by Cynthia Loomis to actually start for for the US government to start stacking Bitcoin. Now it's not going to be passed and it's maybe every token gesture, but clearly people are talking about it. RFK is suggesting there's an actual, you know, strategic reserve always this policy proposal four million Bitcoin or something. You know, there's a world in which like there's a world in which a Bitcoin like him, maybe it's a Vivek or someone like that, is president in 2028, and that really kicks things off. So do I think it's going to happen? Yeah, absolutely. Is it like, do I expect it in the next 12 months? No, but we'll be, it'll be, <laughs> we're very entertained to see it happen. We'll, we'll be watching. Yeah. Well, all right, man. I think this was a great conversation, like kind of like a critical look at, at the ETFs, Bitcoin's future. So I, th- I think that's a good, perhaps a, a, a refreshing uh, conversation through all the bullishness or all the negative stuff where I think we're right in the middle in a, in a, in a positive, <laughs> critical way. So yeah, man, thanks so much for your time. I enjoyed chatting again. And, sure, uh, I enjoyed yeah. it too. Stay in touch, man. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,